Hello and welcome to this week's seminar brought to you by the Living Earth Collaborative at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm Justin Baldwin, and it is my great pleasure to introduce this year's student invited speaker, Professor Dr. Daniel Cadena, who joins us today virtually from Bogota, Colombia. Dr. Cadena earned his undergraduate degree in 2000 from the prestigious Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. Nevertheless, Dr. Cadena is no stranger to St. Louis. He completed his doctoral dissertation at the University of Missouri St. Louis in 2006, where he worked with Drs. Bob Rickliffs and Betty Loisel. He published his graduate research in ecography, ecology letters, and nature, so he skipped postdoctoral work to return to Uniandes in Bogota as an assistant professor, where he eventually earned the title of full professor in 2015. At Uniandes, he currently holds the position of Dean of the School of Sciences. Dr. Cadena's laboratory at Los Andes investigates integrative ecology and evolutionary biology of neotropical birds and other vertebrates. The lab's exciting research program cuts across different ecological, temporal, and spatial scales to address key evolutionary questions. Dr. Cadena's team employs an impressive diversity of techniques that routinely link genetic, mechanistic, and behavioral approaches to high-level ecological and evolutionary processes and spatial patterns of spatial species richness. These findings have been published in top journals such as Current Biology, Ecology Letters, American Naturalist, Systematic Biology, Ornithology, the journal formerly known as the AUK, and Proceedings of the Royal Society B. Moreover, Dr. Cadena's team has contributed profoundly to neotropical ornithology, systematics, and natural history, having described six new species to science, as well as numerous avian hybrid zones. Dr. Cadena advises on the American Ornithological Society's South American Classification Committee, and the AOS counts as an elective member since 2008 and as a fellow since 2016. Beyond this impressive publishing record, he has been awarded international recognition by the World Academy for Sciences for Advancement of Science in Developing Countries for his mentorship of Colombian scientists. To date, he has advised two postdocs, seven doctoral students, 39 master's and bachelor's students, and co-advised 35 more bachelor's theses. These contributions show how extensively Dr. Cadena has cultivated homegrown science and Colombian science and leadership. The flagship project, the Colombia Resurvey Project, which he co-leads, illustrates this impact and has received detailed coverage by the New York Times just three weeks ago. Outside of academia, Dr. Cadena is known for an, an influential Instagram channel, which promotes Colombian biology and natural history, pogo dancing in mosh pits at ska concerts, and competing internationally at endurance sport events such as ultramarathons and Ironman competitions. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Cadena to the Living Earth Collaborative Seminar. And with that, I will hand the microphone over. Wow, uh, thanks Justin for that. Uh, flattering and very complete uh, introduction. Well, thanks everyone. It's it's an honor uh, to be here. Thanks very much for uh, student uh, to students for inviting me. Uh, Justin, Matt, uh, John, and everybody at uh, WashU who made this uh, possible. It's it's really it's really great to be here. Well, like like Justin uh, mentioned, I'm no stranger to the St. Louis ecology and evolution scene. I got my PhD at uh, UMSL, and for us, it was a routine to uh, come over to WashU for department seminars where I got to learn a lot about um, um, biology as a, as a young student. And, and, and I think that my interactions with WashU were, were very influential for, for my uh, career at an early stage. I actually took a course at WashU uh, offered by Dr. Alan Lar Larson on macroevolution, which uh, to this day was a highlight in my in my uh, studies and influenced me a lot. And there I got to interact with a, a bunch of uh, then grad students at WashU that became leaders in macroevolutionary research. People like uh, Rich Glower, uh, Liam Revel, Luke Harmon, uh, Ken Kozak, who I ended up working with. Um, 
were my peers in that uh, class, which was pretty amazing. Um, not, and so it's it's very uh, rewarding to to sort of come back full circle and speak to you today. Um, of course, my my connections and interests with the uh, Missouri Botanical Garden and the St. Louis Zoo, it's it's real uh, honor to be here. And I should also highlight that uh, Carlos Botero, a faculty at WashU right now, was my undergraduate. Uh, well, we went to undergrad together, so he's a good friend and colleague, and it's it's great to share this space with all of you. So so thanks again. It's 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 an honor to be here. So uh, let's get started then. Um, first off, I, I want to highlight that I'm going to present a lot of work, uh, perhaps too much, hope I, I won't go over time. Um, but I want to highlight that uh, by nature, my research is collaborative. Uh, I'm going to show work done by all these people as shown in, the, in this slide. Um, the, the little asterisks uh, indicate uh, students. And actually, I've been fortunate to, to be able to interact with the diversity of undergrad and grad students in Colombia at Universidad de Los Andes over several years. And, uh, and I think that, that working with students has, has been a joy and a tremendous reward. And a lot of what I'm gonna be showing today has been inspired and actually done in many ways by, by students. So uh, I'm interested in, in tropical biodiversity. And uh, of course I live in um, Bogota, Colombia, uh, right at the, well, north of the equator, but in the heart of the tropics. And Colombia, of course, is in many ways a, a biodiverse uh, country. Um, so these are data for uh, ver uh, vertebrates globally. Uh, these figures are probably well known uh, for most of you. Uh, so on the left, you can see the latitudinal uh, diversity gradient showing the high concentration of species in red colors uh, in the Amazon basin and in areas uh, near the Andes. And on the right, you see uh, in the same color scheme, the concentration of restricted range species, species that are endemic to particular areas. So, here in, in the northern neotropics, uh, so we have a hotspot of, of biological diversity and especially of unique species that are not found uh, anywhere else. And just to give you a feeling, but for what I mean by tropical diversity, well, Colombia is this country with nearly 2000 species of birds, uh, which is huge, remarkable diversity by any standard. Um, but just to give you a feeling for it, um, this is a sort of a thought exercise I often do with people and, to, and I'd like to start my talks uh, showing this. So Colombians are very proud of our, our biodiversity. Uh, people, if you stop a random person in the street or here in our campus and ask them whether they know about Colombian biodiversity, they would probably know the, the fact that Colombia is the richest uh, country on bird life on earth. But when you ask people to name um, as many birds as they can, they often have a hard time uh, remembering uh, more than 10 or 20. Um, and just to give you a feeling for, for what the, the enormous diversity of Colombian birds feels like, um, here's a, a sort of a, 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 a little tour. So when I uh, do this thought experiment and tell people to, to name a few bird species, well, people would say things like, you know, the pigeon, the sparrow, the hummingbird, uh, et cetera. But it turns out that when you say the hummingbird in Colombia, you actually mean tens of different things. So these are from the Columbia Field Guide by uh, Steve Hilty showing all the diversity of hummingbirds we have in the country, which is not diversity only in terms of number of species, but also in terms of behavior, uh, plumages, the habitats they use, the interactions they have with other species, um, the ecosystem services they provide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's the, these are all hummingbirds from the Colombian Andes. What I, what I highlight here is that even within a sort of taxonomically restricted group, diversity can be overwhelming in many ways and pretty spectacular. Uh, so none of those are uh, my pictures. These were taken by a photo uh, by this guy, Emory Cooper. Um, but I wanted to give you a feeling of, of what I mean when I talk about high bird diversity. And something I wanna highlight is that it, not only is diversity very high, but it's still insufficiently known so like Justin mentioned, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to work with colleagues, helping to document the diversity of Colombian birds. And here are examples of a bunch of different species we have described over the years. Uh, and I think there's, there's still a lot uh, to be found out there. So not only do we have high diversity, but uh, that, that diversity remains insufficiently known. So here's an outline for what I'd like to do today. Um, I wanna focus on two main questions for the talk. One, in which I will spend most of the time, is to ask the question of why is diversity so high in Northern South America? And for this, I'm gonna focus on, the, on questions about diversification 
talking about some old and newer ideas on the origin of diversity. And then I'm gonna spend some time uh, on, a, on another question, which is um, looking into the future and asking uh, whether we are conserving ecological and evolutionary processes that are gonna sustain that diversity into the long term. And here I wanna focus on, on the project we're working on right now using historical collections and, and modern resurveys as windows across time to study biodiversity. So let's get going with that first question, which I'll, I'll focus for most of the time. Okay, so over the years, uh, I've been interested in the discipline of phylogeography, looking at the distribution of genetic lineages within species in space. And this is sort of a, a typical study we would uh, conduct. This was led by undergrad student uh, Natalia Gutierrez, where we sample uh, birds across the Andean landscape. In this case, you can see the map on the right. I apologize because my cursor is not working, but I'll try to do my best to point you to different areas of sight. Uh, so here, each dot corresponds to a locality, which is color coded, for, from which we studied a specimen for which we sequenced, in this case, mitochondrial DNA. And on the left side, you see a, a phylogenetic tree with a bunch of haplotype networks. Um, and the point I want to make here is that there is a lot of genetic structure within species. Uh, and that genetic structure is influenced by geography. Like different lineages uh, occur on different cordilleras, on different slopes of a cordillera, within a cordillera separated by dry valleys. And so something I, we think is very important in generating tropical diversity is the role of such physical barriers, which limit gene flow among populations and sets, a, sets them on a separate evolutionary trajectories. That diversity, uh, does not only manifest itself in terms of genetic structure, we see a lot of geographic variation in things like uh, plumages, external phenotypes. So this is a system on uh, arm on brush finches I've worked on for uh, several years, studying geographic variation in plumage, like say the presence or absence or the extent of this black pectoral band you can see on specimens on the left, um, looking at variation in songs, etc. And there's also, um, well, there's good correspondence in general between variation in phenotype, um, both on the external morphology and behavior of birds and genetic variation structured by geographic barriers. So we think that a lot of diversification in this region is uh, spurred by geographic isolation, uh, which promotes genetic isolation and subsequent phenotypic and behavioral divergence essentially in allopatry. Um, another component of the buildup of species diversity uh, in the neotropics is that you not only accumulate or you not only initiate processes of genetic divergence, but such processes uh, persist over time. And I wanna illustrate this point with our study of the phylogeography of, of the great breasted woodwren shown here. Uh, in which we sampled again mitochondrial DNA from a bunch of different populations. We calibrated this phylogenetic tree using a standard uh, substitution rate. And beyond the question of how many species are, are, are you willing to recognize here, uh, the, one, the point I wanna make is, is relatively subtle. So the numbers on, on the top indicate the number of lineages that exist based on, on genetic data for different, uh, at different moments in time as given by estimates of age on this clade on the bottom. And we can take, for example, so within this taxon, which people typically recognize as one or perhaps up to three species, there are at least 12 lineages that have not exchanged genes, as far as we can tell based on this data set, for three million years or more. Just to reiterate that, there are 42 lineages within this species that have remained isolated from others for at least 1 million years. So I'm not prepared to call all these lineages species, a question which depends on what species are, but I, what I think this illustrates unequivocally is that there's a lot of old genetic divergence among populations and persistence of populations in the tropics, uh, I would argue is a fundamental component of speciation uh, that le leads to accumulation of genetic divergence and uh, species through time. Things not only differentiate themselves, but persist. I focus a lot of my work on uh, tropical mountains, and I wanna justify that briefly 
looking at this plot, this was produced by two former master students, uh, Elkin Tenorio and Paula Montoya, who looked at uh, latitudinal gradients and the diversity of a bunch of different uh, vertebrate groups. Um, so in the plot, you can see latitude on the x-axis and species richness on the vertical axis. And Elkin and Paola uh, separated um, regions by whether they occur on mountains or lowlands. And the point I want to make here is that you see a latitudinal gradient in diversity. Diversity declines predictably with elevation. But you can see that the slopes of the red lines are much steeper. So the latitudinal gradient is steeper for taxa in mountains. So we'd argue that mountains are fundamental to understanding the latitudinal diversity gradient, which is one of the most salient patterns in biogeography. And speaking about mountains, when, when you look at, this is the, the global richness of birds um, uh, across um, all continents, you can see that the Andes and well, tropical mountains in general are hotspots of biological diversity. So areas in, in this map that are shown in, in white, like you can see in the tropical lands of South America, mountains in East Africa and the Himalayas are regions where you get both high richness of both old species and relatively young species. So you can speak of, of mountain regions as both museums and cradles of diversity, areas where you get per persistence, long-term pers persistence of old taxa and also areas of active speciation. And also mountains are hotspots of beta diversity, of turnover in, of species uh, in space. Uh, so I, I'd argue to understand the causes of uh, global patterns of, of diversity, the study of mountains is critical. And one of the reasons, or perhaps the main reason, why mountains are hotspots of beta diversity, of change in species uh, richness in uh, space, is the phenomenon of elevational replacement, in which I've worked a, a fair bit over, the, over, over recent years. And I want to illustrate that with data for uh, three neotropical bird families. So here you can see three panes on, uh, on the, uh, the upper portion of the slide for three neotropical families, where each line is the elevational distribution of a single species. So the first point I want to make is that you, you will see here, I hope, that there's not a single species that encompasses the whole elevational gradient in the neotropics. And actually you see replacements of assemblages of species as you move up a mountain. And if you take the, the data in the upper plot and uh, extract it and, and construct histograms like the ones I show on the bottom plots, in on uh, the bottom plots, what you can see is that the median elevational range consistently across these three uh, avian families is approximately a thousand meters elevation. So in many places here in the Andes, Mountains may span 4,000, 5,000 meters, but the typical species only occupies 1,000 meters elevation. So I've become very interested in, in the causes of restricted elevational ranges, but also in this phenomenon of closely related species which replace each other with elevation, congeners that replace each other with elevation, which is a very important component of this pattern of beta diversity in mountains. This is not, uh, a, a pattern that is restricted to birds, the idea that organisms have restricted elevation ranges and show elevational replacements. Here's a data set we've been working on with uh, my former grad student, uh, Paulo Pulgarin. Paulo uh, studied um, not only birds, but also their uh, blood parasites, avian malaria. Uh, this was actually influenced a lot and we're collaborating on this with um, my former advisor, Bob Rickless, in, in, who was in St. Louis. Um, and here what we're showing you is that the elevational ranges of parasite lineages, uh, not in the Andes, but this is a, in a different tropical biodiversity hotspot, which are mountains in uh, New Guinea. And what you can see here is that the parasites also replace each other with elevation. And that is closely linked with what you can see in the bottom part of the slide, where it seems that at least in this assemblage, uh, there's a tight association between parasite lineages and avian hosts. So elevational replacement in birds is associated with elevational replacement in parasites. So I'd argue that this is probably a general phenomenon in tropical mountains and understanding the causes of elevational replacements um, is paramount to understanding gradients in species richness. So there are two ways in which uh, these elevational replacements might arise. And this was laid out beautifully in a classic paper by uh, Jim Patton and uh, Mary Smith in 1992 in which they studied uh, rodents in the genus Acodon uh, in the Peruvian Andes. And essentially what they proposed is 
If you take a, a look at the figure in the upper left, and you have two different mountains in which in one mountain, you have the elevation replacement of big A and big B species with elevation. And the, in the other mountain, you have little A and little B. You can explain that pattern based on two different models. One would be a gradient model, model of speciation or a parapatric model of speciation where big A and big B are sister species and uh, little a and little b are sister species in turn. So in this case, perhaps what you had was originally a single species with a broad elevation range, which diverged in parapatry owing to divergent selection into two different species that replace each other with elevation. The alternative is that close relatives do not occur at the same mountain, but occur at similar elevations in different mountains. So in that model, which uh, Pat and Smith called the Brett Carrick model, Little a and big A are, are sister, and little b and um, big B are sister. It's organisms with similar elevational ranges, which occur on separate mountains. Um, in their classic study, uh, Patton and Smith found evidence for the vicarate model and not for the gradient model. But over the past few years, we've been thinking about um, you know, testing this hypothesis more broadly with a bunch of different uh, birds and other vertebrates in the neotropics. So I'd like to touch on uh, briefly on, on this study system, which I have become very fond of uh, over the years. And I actually worked, started working on these guys where uh, I was at UMSL in, the, in about 2003, I think. And, and so these birds are called uh, tapaculos. Uh, I think of them as more mice than birds. They're very difficult to see. They run more than what they fly. They're all very cryptic. Believe it or not, uh, these, uh, Eight specimens shown here correspond to eight different species from the Andes of Ecuador. They're very hard to tell apart, but we know based on their voices and genetics that they're different species. And, and these organisms reach their highest diversity in the tropical Andes. And, and that's what you can see on the figure on the left. So green is the diversity of predominantly young taxa and bright green indicates high diversity of young taxa. So these are concentrated in the highlands in northern South America, whereas older, more uh, depopulated lineages are found in the lowlands. In the figure uh, on the right, I hope you're bearing with me without a cursor, uh, I'm showing four different uh, elevation gradients, the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta, the Pacific Slope of the Western Cordillera of Colombia, uh, areas of the Eastern Slope of the Andes in Ecuador and Peru, and what you can see on the left of that figure is the elevational ranges of species in this clade, which replace each other with elevation. So we have this phenomenon of elevational replacement occurring in different mountains. And the question we want to ask is whether the species that replace each other on a given mountain are close relatives, as predicted by the great model, or distant relatives, as predicted by the Vicarian model. So for this, I worked for several years on the generation of a robust molecular phylogeny of this group which includes um, a variety of species, uh, many of them cryptic, which we have described over the years. And I think we have a, a sufficiently robust phylogeny to address uh, this main question. And I'm gonna summarize that briefly um, with this figure here, based on, on work I did with my uh, student, uh, Laura Cespedes. And I want you to focus initially on, on the uh, plot um, at the upper end. And you can see that the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, this isolated mountain in nor Northern Colombia, has two species of uh, tapaculos, both of them endemic, which replace each other with elevation, uh, Santa Martae and La Tegricula. And you can see on the left, their position on the phylogenetic tree. So these birds are definitely not sister species. They replace each other in this isolated mountain, but they probably got there independently. They're not the product of a single colonization with elevational uh, speciation. And the same is true if you, if you take the second gradient, which is pretty remarkable in the Western Andes, you get the replacement of six different species on an elevation gradient. And you can see that these species are scattered throughout the phylogenetic tree. The same occurs in the Eastern slope of, of Ecuador. There's a slightly different situation in Peru, but I wanna, I wanna emphasize that the most recurrent pattern we see is what I just described. Closely related species, uh, occur in geographically separate regions, and the taxa that replace each other with elevation are not close relatives, meaning that these elevation replacements probably result from the secondary contact of species that diverge in alpatry, even in these birds that are very poor dispersers. Actually, we did uh, some work uh, years ago in, in 
for this paper, I collaborated with uh, Ken Kozak, who, which, who was a, a grad student in, in your department at WashU. And we looked at um, the um, uh, ecological niches of sister species occurring in mountains in, tropi in tropical and temperate ecosystems. Um, our focus here was on, on, on a particular hypothesis uh, proposed by uh, Dan Jansen years ago, in which I'll get into in a minute. But the point here is that we found that consistently across all these groups of vertebrates, uh, the phenomenon I just described is recurrent. Closely re related species show high overlap in the thermal niches, which is on the vertical axis here, meaning that typically closely related species occur at the same elevations. So we get speciation within elevational zones in different regions. Speciation is predominantly allopatric within elevational zones and not on a given mountain um, across uh, thermal gradients. And like I said, a framework to, uh, to study diversity in mountains has been this influential uh, Janssen's hypothesis, which basically states that in, in the tropics, there is very limited thermal overlap between environments at different elevations. And this should select with organisms with restricted uh, thermal tolerances. And this restriction in thermal tolerance then um, limits gene flow across elevation uh, gradients or across mountain passes or valleys, and would be a mechanism that would uh, lead to a greater speciation in tropical mountains as compared to mountains in the temperate zone in which uh, organisms are exposed to a lot of environmental fluctuations across the, the year owing to seasonal um, changes in temperature. This idea has been explored a lot in the literature, um, but something we, we've been trying to look at it is um, how does this phenomenon of thermal overlap across elevations uh, vary in space? And what I'm showing you here in this plot is, so the lines on the, on the map on the left are different elevational transects for which we measured the distance in elevation between pairs of points. And then we plotted on the vertical axis how much thermal overlap there is. And what you can see here is that, well, there's, some gradients in the tropical mountains where there's very little thermal overlap across elevations, but you can see there's a lot of scatter. So there's a lot of different thermal gradients within the Andes, and we're interested in seeing how this influences patterns of diversity. And actually, we're trying to go big with this, and we built similar plots for a bunch of different elevational gradients worldwide. And we want, what we want to do now with our, my colleagues uh, Ignacio Quintero, uh, Juan Parra, and uh, Ethan Link, is to try to link these patterns of how environment varies with elevation on mountains with things such as the uh, patterns of beta diversity, of replacement of species with elevation, uh, diversification rates, and the accumulation of diversity uh, through time. So that's sort of the, the work we've been doing uh, from a, I'd say, macroecological scale. So far, I've, uh, I've focused on, on you know, the, the idea that populations diverge in allopatry, uh, they uh, speciate, they come back together, and that leads to the buildup of, of diversity. But something I want to highlight that ha has been a lot less studied in, in tropical mountain systems is that this phenomenon of, of range expansion and secondary contact does not always lead to the accumulation of diversity. And I'll illustrate that quickly with these two different birds from the Colombian and Ecuadorian Andes, which if you look at the extremes, they look very different. Uh, but if you look at, uh, in detail at what happens in this area in southern Colombia and northern Ecuador, and this was worked by my master's student, uh, Laura Cespedes, what you find is that there is uh, uh, a lot of variation. And actually, uh, what you can see here on the top and the very bottom, there are the two uh, uh, pure forms. But when you go to the center of this uh, gradient I just showed you, you get all sorts of phenotypic variation. And actually, you do not find any pure populations in the center. It's like this hybrid swarm where there's probably uh, several generations of uh, hybridization going on. So we actually characterized the zone uh, with uh, Laura and our colleagues. And what, what she found is that in the center of the hybrid zone, uh, when you look at plumage variation based on a hybrid index on the figure on the left, the most frequent phenotypes are intermediate phenotypes suggested that hybrids are probably doing okay. Also, the transition zone between the two zones, as, uh, between the two species, sorry, as indicated by climate analysis, is very wide. You see at least 200 kilometers 
of this hybrid zone where you get the transition of one phenotype to the other. And when you look at genome-wide genetic divergence as uh, evidenced by the rat seq data um, analyzed using a, an admixture plot uh, above, you see that, well, they're clearly not two distinct genetic clusters, but we see a continuum of variation uh, in genetics. So what we think here is that probably these birds diverge in geographic isolation, perhaps during a period of um, isolation driven by climate change. Then something changed and distributions came back together and they hadn't differentiated enough to behave as full species that would perhaps replace each other with elevation, but instead might be merging back into uh, a single species. So there's a lot going on in the end, we think, uh, in terms of the dynamics of these cycles of isolation, divergence, secondary contact, uh, et cetera. Okay, so, so far I've talked about speciation in various ways, but I've focused on sort of, um, you know, old ideas about speciation, you know, whether is it allopatric or uh, parapatric, whether it occurs in the presence of barriers or without barriers, uh, et cetera. Now I wanna to touch on, on sort of different ways we think divergence accumulates in the tropics. I'd start by saying that things are not always as simple as, as I have showed you in the previous examples. So here I wanna highlight this case of these beautiful hummingbirds from the Colombian and Venezuelan Andes. We've been uh, studying with uh, Catalina Palacios, a former student in the lab. And briefly, what you can see here is that you see two different uh, morphs um, that are essentially purple in their uh, underparts and two other uh, morphs that are golden in their underparts. These are referred to as two different species, which occur in the, in the Colombian Eastern uh, Andes and uh, mountains in adjacent Venezuela. It turns out that when you look at mitochondrial DNA variation, you cannot tell these things apart. So the colors correspond to the colors in the map. So the two species share haplotypes, the different uh, subspecies uh, shown here uh, share haplotypes. And if anything, what, you, what we see in the mitochondrial DNA is a divergence between northern and southern populations. So a northern clade that includes both northern forms of the purple dark morph and the golden green morph, and a southern clade that includes representatives of both morphs again. When you look at um, markers across the genome, you actually see a very complicated story where actually the species are not monophyletic and there's evidence of uh, gene flow across their evolutionary history. So some people might interpret this to mean, well, these things are perhaps not different species. Have you looked at the morphology carefully? And the point is we have looked at the morphology carefully. These things are very different. Uh, there's no case where, well, perhaps one case we know of, where you find a bird that you can assign to one species, they're pretty showy, spectacular. This is one of the species, this is the other one. They're very distinct in their phenotype, but what we're seeing is that they're, they're, they share a lot of, the, of their genes. So to try to understand what might be going on here, we uh, went on and sequenced the whole genome of our representatives of, of these taxa and constructed this um, Manhattan plot where you have different areas of the genome plotted against uh, FST. What you can see here is that there's a very low level of, of background genetic divergence between the two species with some areas that show significant uh, differentiation shown by the block, uh, blue dots. So you might think, well, perhaps those dots are responsible for uh, traits that are involved in speciation and we might be able to find you know, the genes uh, underlying species differences. Well, it's not that simple because when you do genomic comparisons between the populations of the same species, in some cases we find that actually FST within species is greater than among species. And actually something we found is that many of the peaks that we identified in the cross species comparison as outliers uh, showing high divergence, actually show, uh, show up as outliers in within species comparisons. So probably these are not genes linked to speciation, but this reflects some sort of influence of genomic architecture and patterns of divergence. Perhaps these are regions of low recombination or things like that. So basically what Catalina did at the end, which was very clever, I thought, was that she took um, um, all the comparisons we had and she identified areas of the genome that are different between the plumage phenotypes, but are the same within the plumage phenotype. And at some point we hope, well, here we're gonna find the holy grail, you know, against this backdrop of genomic homogeneity, we're gonna find the genes responsible for speciation. Well, it's not that simple. There's a lot of genes 
that uh, show divergence uh, or not even genes, regions where uh, genes are located that show differences among these taxa. Uh, and we think perhaps that speciation here, it's, it's probably polygenic, polygenic and in some way, um, selection on a bunch of different loci that control quantitative traits like plumage here uh, might be uh, responsible for divergence in the face of gene flow. Uh, so it's not uh, always that simple. So in the final uh, minutes of this part of the talk, I want to focus on other modes of evolutionary divergence in the neotropics. And I want to talk about two things mainly. One is divergence in relation to time. I've talked about uh, divergence related to space. Let me talk about time uh, briefly. So my uh, student Miguel Moreno is, is interested in, in the seasonality in reproduction in birds. And he has been compiling this very large database uh, with a bunch of records from a variety of different sources, asking the very basic questions that for people in the temperate zone it might be trivial because in the temperate zone, organisms reproduce synchron synchronously in the spring and summer. We don't know basically when do birds reproduce in Colombia. We don't have enough information on general patterns. But what Miguel showed based on his data or he, this is ongoing work is that when you take data for all the country, all the data you can pull, uh, it seems like there's a peak in breeding shown by the purple area uh, arrow on the left around um, April, mid April to, to May. That's the so overall signal in the data. But when you take different regions of Colombia, which might be very close to each other geographically, and that's what I'm showing on the right, you might get different patterns. So in the upper right, you see the uh, breeding season across a year for uh, a given region. It seems to be centered between uh, March and April. But in another region shown in the bottom, breeding instead seems to be concentrated between May and June, right? So we're, we've become interested in the question on whether this asynchronous breeding, populations breeding at different times in different regions, likely in association to change to spatial variation in food availability might influence population divergence. And in particular, we've been asking the question of whether allochronic divergence mediated by climate might be linked to speciation. And this was work that uh, Ignacio Quintero uh, did as an undergrad in my lab and finished when he was a grad student at, at Yale. And I don't have uh, too much time, but, but the point here, um, I wanna illustrate the, the basic idea that Ignacio developed. So the idea being that if you have three different populations, like on the figure on the uh, left-hand side, and you, you look at a precipitation regimes in those areas shown by the curves, the prediction is that birds are gonna breed, and those are the green uh, bars, when precipitation is high, because that is linked to high abundance of food, particularly uh, insects. And the idea here is that if you have populations that have very asynchronous rainfall, they, the prediction would be they should have asynchronous breeding seasons. And such asynchrony breeding seasons is expected to promote genetic divergence to various mechanisms. So what Ignacio did was take phylogeographic data for I think it was 60 uh, groups of neotropical birds and asked the question of whether populations that are more asynchronous in breeding in, in precipitation regimes are, mo are more genetically differentiated once you account for effects of topography, barriers, et cetera, which I talked about. And the answer to my great surprise was yes. Uh, actually, Ignacio did a phylogenetic meta-analysis across a bunch of different species. And the overall signal of an um, analysis relating, that's the, the coefficient you can see on the, on the, on the bottom, um, relating the asynchrony in rainfall to genetic divergence was positive. So populations that are more asynchronous in their um, precipitation regimes, presumably influencing breeding seasons, are more genetically divergent. And we actually replicated these for neotropical frogs in, in a paper that is in revision right now, and we found the same uh, pattern, which is pretty striking to me, that perhaps climate has a role in furthering uh, genetic divergence in the tropics. Okay, and the other mechanism I wanna talk about is, uh, so I've talked about space, I just briefly talked about time, and now I wanna combine the two things, space and time, in relation to behavior. And in particular, I wanna talk about migratory behavior. 
And this is work that was done by my former master student, uh, Valentina Gomez, uh, on um, four-tailed flycatchers uh, from uh, South America. And the story with this taxon is very interesting. So I, I want you to focus, th there will be an animation in a, in a second, in a moment. So if you look at the figure, see my cursor is back up. <laughs> if you look at the figure on the right, I want you to focus on what goes on here in Northern South America, the, the Llanos of Colombia and Venezuela, and what goes on here in areas of uh, Northern Argentina and Southern Brazil. This is a, the abundance of birds in January, and this is gonna go through uh, the changes in abundance through time as estimated by EBER data from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So you can see here how birds are moving through the landscape over time. And right here, note that all the birds are concentrated in the north. And then again, we get a separation with some birds in the south and other birds in the north. Then another cycle comes and all of them are concentrated in the north. So this species is a partial migrant, meaning that some populations are resident year round and they stay in Colombia and Northern South America for all the year, they breed in this area, but other are, others are seasonal migrants. They migrate during the austral summer to Southern South America, breed there, and then come back during the austral winter. And then they are sympathetic with the, with the birds during part of the seasonal cycle. So what Valentina did was a bunch of different things. I'm gonna summarize very quickly but um, in a single slide. First, she looked at uh, genetic variation in this taxon. And what she found is that, well, we can tell apart uh, the sedentary and the migratory subspecies uh, indicating that gene flow is reduced. And also if you do a variety of different analyses, it appears that the sedentary subspecies is derived from migratory populations. When you look at the population genetics of these uh, populations, the, the sedentary subspecies has low uh, heterozygosity and uh, uh, high values of Tajima's D, uh, whereas the migratory subspecies has high heterozygosity and low values of Tajima's D, indicating perhaps that the migratory subspecies is, is, is larger and ancestral uh, and the uh, sedentary subspecies went through a bottleneck uh, following perhaps a founder event. Also, we found that these birds differ in breeding seasons. The sedentary subspecies breeds from February to April. The migratory one breeds from October to January. Importantly, when the sedentary birds are breeding in Colombia between February and April, the migratory birds are here as well, but they're not breeding. And also we found that these birds differ in a bunch of different traits. For example, the sedentary subspecies has long tails, and more rounded wings, whereas the migratory one has uh, pointed wings and short tails, suggesting that the morphology of the migratory one might be molded by natural selection for more efficient flight, whereas perhaps the morphology of the, of the resident tropical population has been influenced by sexual selection leading to uh, greater tail lengths. So what we think here is that these two things are two different species where a sedentary subspecies evolved from a migratory subspecies as a migratory drop-off, as a change in behavior. And I want to highlight here that we don't think that this was probably initiated by a genetic change, but perhaps was spurred by a behavioral change, which set these populations in different evolutionary trajectories, which eventually led to the origin of a new species. Valentina scaled up her analysis, and I'm going to go over this very quickly, but she found that what we saw in, in this system, in the, in the fork-tailed flycatcher, might have occurred repeatedly across the flycatcher phylogeny with the most, uh, with the best supported evolutionary model being a model where migratory behavior leads to the origin of sedentary populations via partially migratory um, species, which is exactly the situation we found in uh, Tyrannus. And also she estimated the speciation rates or diversification rates, if you want, as estimated from molecular phylogeny. And it turns out that partially migratory and migratory taxa in the whole flycatcher phylogeny have greater rates of diversification than sedentary organisms. So we think that these changes in behavior influencing migration might be uh, spurring um, evolutionary divergence. Okay, I wanna end and uh, this part of the talk and then spend the last few uh, minutes uh, talking, uh, talking about the other part, 
But the message here is that these patterns that we see of diversity in mountains, which have fascinated naturalists for many years, including Colombian naturalist Francisco Jose de Caldas, who made this beautiful draw drawing, Caldas was a contemporary of Humboldt, um, can be illuminated by you know, the, the consideration of evolutionary relationships and the history of facts. Okay, so quickly, let's move on to the uh, final part of the talk. I, I hope I'll, stay, I'll probably spend here less than 10 minutes, so please bear with me. And the question is whether we are conserving uh, ecological and evolutionary processes in the long term to sustain this biodiversity I've talked about for the past 45 uh, minutes or so, or 40 minutes or so. And for that, I'm, um, I want to focus on, the, um, um, on this project we're doing on reserving uh, Colombia from an ornithological viewpoint. Between 1910 and 1915, the American Museum of Natural History came to Colombia to survey birds. They visited many different localities throughout the country, led by Mr. Frank Chapman on the left, the curator of birds at the museum. This expedition led to the collection of nearly 16,000 bird specimens that were exported to the US and set the basis for the publication by Chapman in 1917 of one of my favorite books um, on the distribution of bird life in Colombia, in which he basically provided an impressive synthesis of the biogeography of the Northern Neotropics based on the distributions of birds in the Colombian and the region. Chapman's work was very influential. Uh, it has been inspiring for my work in many ways. And a few years ago with my uh, late colleague, uh, Gustavo Catan, we uh, reviewed the contributions of Chapman. And what we found in, the, in this figure to the right is that his work was not cited very much in the literature through much of the 20th century but has been increasingly cited over recent years. And, and Chapman produced very important ideas about the origins of tropical diversity that have only been amenable to testing with genetic and biogeographic data recently. So this was a monumental piece of work that uh, laid the groundwork for much of tropical uh, biogeography and for neotropical ornithology for sure. So we a few years ago or a couple of years ago, we launched uh, this, a big project, which we call the Columbia Reserve Project, which we've, we're doing in, 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 um, as a dedication to our colleague, uh, Gustavo, who spurred all this. And this is a multi-institutional project with researchers at various, various uh, stages in their career from various institutions in Colombia and the US, in which we're revisiting the historical sites that the American Museum visited 110 years ago. And we're hoping to ask questions about the change in biodiversity through time. So I want to tell you about two uh, brief stories about our expeditions. First, our, our first expedition, which was funded to, uh, by National Geographic, and we visited the site called Toche in Tolima Department, the Central Andes of Colombia. Uh, we went there in uh, 2009 as a pilot to sort of get going with this expeditionary work. I'm gonna tell you first the good news. So this is a photo of this spectacular site taken by Frank Chapman in 1911. We were able to visit the exact same site that Chapman visited uh, in 2019. And this is a picture I took with my cell phone. So this is the most spectacular forest I've ever seen. It was amazing to see that these remains in a relatively pristine uh, state. But all the news are not good. Uh, here's a couple of uh, photos uh, that show what has ha changed in this landscape. The figure on the left is by Chapman in 1911. The figure on the right, the photo was taken by uh, Glenn Zeeholzer and uh, David Campo from our team in 2019. You can see a lot of interesting things here. One is deforestation. Um, the other is, it seems that there's a lot of forest still in 2019, but a lot of those trees you see there are actually pine tree plantations. So it has been deforestation and conversion of native forests into plantations. And something you might be able to see, my cursor is not working again, is uh, sort of on, on the upper right, there was a big glacier in 1911 that is no longer there in uh, 2019. We also see changes like, like this shown here in 1911, much of the landscape was covered by forests. That's no, no, not longer the case in 2019. So the question now is, is what's going on with the birds? And it's pretty interesting what we found. Actually, we found more bird species in 2019 than these guys did in 1911. This is in part due because we have tools that they didn't have at their disposal. These guys were essentially working with shotguns. Now we have 
field guides, uh, tape recordings, knowledge of avian vocalizations, misnets, etc. But overall, we found uh, uh, between their survey and ours about 300 species. What I want to highlight here is that although the total number of species perhaps hasn't changed much over time, the composition of species has changed dramatically. Close to 45% of species disappeared that were there in 1911 and have been replaced by others. That is, I think, pretty remarkable. Why is it remarkable? Well, I'm going to show you another example from work we did in another site called the San Antonio Forest, which has been surveyed over time. And this site that has experienced loss of forest cover through time with some recovery over recent years and a corresponding loss in species richness with re some recovery of species richness through time. This site is, is very unique because it was surveyed by Chapman in, a, in the 1910s, but was also surveyed by Miller in the 50s, by Gustavo Catan in the 1990s, and again in the 2000s. And you can see, well, the diversity has, well, there's a lot of diversity loss, but how bad has this been? So what we did was with uh, Camila Gomez and uh, El Quintenorio, we did not look only at the diversity of species, but we looked at the ecology of species. And what I'm showing you here are a bunch of different figures uh, showing the functional diversity of these uh, assemblage through time. So in the upper left, you can see that not only did we lose diversity from the 1910s into the, the present, but also the functional diversity. And so this is based on, on things like body size, measures of big, uh, bill size, habitat, breadth, et cetera, has declined through time. The plot on the upper right shows in, in morphological space in three dimensions. Points are species that are unique to the 1900s. Points in blue are species that are unique to the present. And gray is the intersection. And the point here is that the phenotypic space covered by these assemblage of birds has changed over time. And it has, it has changed. If you, if you look at the figures on the bottom, I'll say this, this quickly, so bear with me. The assemblages have changed predictably in three ways. In the present, well, the, the figure shows species in, in red are those that were extirpated, in blue species that arrived into the community. So the message is the assemblage has lost species of large body size, but has gained species of high dispersal ability. And on the other hand, it has lost habitat specialists and has received a bunch of habitat generalists. So we're seeing some changes in diversity with some recovery in diversity, but the functional ecology of this ecosystem, which perhaps indexes its health, has changed over time. Um, I'm running a little bit over time, I think. So I'm, I'm not gonna, well, I'm gonna tell you the story because I think it's fun. I, I, please bear with me, I apologize if, if I'm running over. Uh, something very interesting we found in, in, in Toche, in this, in this area in the Central Andes, is that um, we, our expedition occurred essentially in the same dates that the American Museum expedition took place a hundred uh, and some years later. And we found that about 20% of those species that were missing were neotropical migrants, species that uh, breed in the temperate zone and come to South America to spend the winter. That was uh, tantalizing uh, to say the least, but now I wanna show you of, uh, an idea of what we think might be going on. One of the possibilities is that simply the phenology might be might have changed the phenology of migration based on uh, climate change, for instance, or perhaps the abundance of species has declined so that we are missing the early tail of migration when birds were perhaps less abundant. Um, but I want to highlight this other uh, case, which I think is, it's pretty interesting. And this is a study based on uh, we did on, on these uh, black hole warblers from South America which spend the winter here in the Llanos of Eastern Colombia, but breed in the North Temperate Zone uh, in uh, Northern uh, Canada, actually. So based on radio telemetry data by our colleague, uh, Nick Bailey and his team, we know that birds that uh, come to Colombia are, have their breeding areas uh, predominantly in the extreme Northeastern uh, North America. And based on isotope data from feathers, we collected between 2018 and 2019, we were able to generate a model shown on the upper right, predicting the geographic provenance of these specimens that we captured in Colombia. So based on, on the isotopic signature of feathers, we can make inferences of where these birds uh, came from. And actually, uh, 
when I saw this, I, I started thinking, well, what if we could go back to historical specimens and see if there has been any change through time? And actually, I had a full drawer of these specimens right here in, in my university, which were collected in the 1970s. Um, so what we did with Camila Gomez and others was use the data from these historical specimens and do the same with isotopes as we did with the modern samples and ask whether we could detect any geographic changes. And this to us was pretty remarkable. So if you look at the extreme upper right hand of um, Eastern North America, you can see that the birds in 1972 to 75 that came to Colombia that were captured here probably came from a more Southern latitudes than the birds from 2018 and 2019. There might be a bunch of different explanations for this. Perhaps climate change has pushed the northern range of the species to the north, sort of a shift in the geographic distribution of populations. Or the other possibility is that deforestation in the boreal forest has extirpated populations from the southern range. And now we get essentially birds from the northern stream as compared to what we got in the 70s. This is the sort of thing we're hoping to do with this research project. So I'm going to end um, briefly by highlighting, highlighting another angle of our project, which is the people. So these are uh, Chapman and his colleagues in 1913 in Onda, Colombia. And I want to highlight how elegant these people were in the field. This is probably like 40 degrees Celsius there, and these guys are wearing um, suits and ties. It's pretty amazing. Uh, but something I want to highlight is that in, the, in the, the expedition that came here and did all this fantastic work was done very differently from the way we do science right now. Uh, this is described in some way by, by a historian, Colombian historian, uh, Camilo Quintero, who highlighted in his book um, so, some sort of uh, asymmetries in the way this expedition was conducted between the US scientists and the Colombian society. So I'm, I'm gonna point out three facts. I'm not uh, judging anyone. I know this is a, a different time right now. And I'm, I'm speaking with a hundred plus years of hindsight, but three things to bear in mind. The, 19, uh, the expedition from the 1900s uh, included only men, only white men, as far as we can tell, no women. Second, all of the specimens, 16,000 specimens, left Colombia and have been deposited at museums in the US where they haven't been perhaps as successful for Colombian scientists. And third, from all the material that was generated through the expedition, there were a bunch of different publications and there was no Colombian scientists involved with this body of work. Of course, things have changed now, and rather than criticizing what happened in the past, I wanna tell you how we're doing things right now. Chapman wrote in 1917 that the future was with Colombians, that Colombians would be the ones that would be filling the gaps in their knowledge. And that is precisely what we're trying to do. And we wanna do this collaborating effectively with North American scientists, but also involving Colombian society uh, to the best of our, ab ab uh, of our abilities. So I wanna highlight differences between what was done years ago, and what, what is going on uh, right now. So there are uh, Luis Agas y Fuertes and uh, Frank Chapman, very elegant in the field, um, doing their, their thing. These are beautiful watercolor paintings that Fuertes painted in the field while being at San Antonio. This is the site for which I showed you the changes in functional diversity through time. We are now, Probably we're not very good right now at, uh, at you know, generating art, but we have other ways to document what we're doing. So we're sort of active in social media, documenting the kind of work we do. Uh, we've produced uh, documentaries. This, this was launched a couple of weeks ago. It's on YouTube. I can share the link later if people want to see it. Uh, that was very well received by, by people in Colombia, something like 11,000 views in a couple of weeks. Um, and in terms of going back to my title slide, why are, uh, am I talking about the future of biological diversity? Well, we launched this project in 2020 to 2021, um, in which we're doing you know, our thing. We're doing ornithological expeditions to increase knowledge, build natural history collections, and ask research questions. One of the other exciting things I'm going to tell you about today is that we're sequencing genomes of birds from 100 years ago and birds from today and asking questions about changes in population genetics through time. But in addition to that, in these five sites we chose for the expeditions with all, with all these institutions, we're doing two other things. We are empowering local knowledge 
by building capacity for people who want to do local monitoring of bird populations so that they can um, you know, embrace knowledge. And, and we're also doing this uh, dialogue where we're trying to build knowledge with local communities. And the other thing that our project is trying to do is to leave something in the communities in terms of uh, opportunities for livelihoods. So the project involves the development of a um, bird tourism route where we expect that people would want to come to Colombia, perhaps from St. Louis, to go to these spectacular sites look at some birds, but also learn about the history of Colombia and the history of biological exploration in the country. And those tours are gonna to be operated by local communities. So I'm gonna close just by showing you a few figures, a few photos that I hope highlight how we're doing things differently from hundred years ago. Uh, uh, our teams are, uh, are trying to make, we're trying to make our teams more diverse and inclusive or as diverse and inclusive as we can. This has garnered a popular attention. This was featured in a major Colombian newspaper a few uh, weeks ago. You know, journalists like this talk about uh, science decolonization. We wanna emphasize more that the idea of making science more inclusive and more diverse. And actually one of our expeditions was led entirely by women who went to the field and did fantastic work um, as part of this project. Uh, like Justin mentioned at the beginning, this even made it into the cover of the New York Times, which was pretty amazing uh, for us. So with that, I'll show you a few pictures of, of what I think is the future. And in order to conserve the, all these um, evolutionary processes that I talked about at the beginning, that's not gonna be done by scientists. That's gonna be done by local communities. So what we're trying to do is you know, build knowledge with them and empower them for the protection of their natural heritage. The conservation of the high diversity of the tropical Andes is actually with the people that inhabit these landscapes. So with that, I, I sorry, I think I went over time, but I, I hope that wasn't too much of a pain for you. I appreciate you uh, inviting me once again, and I'd like to end with uh, acknowledging our funding uh, sources. And thanks so much again for the invitation and for listening. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Cadena. That was a really terrific tour de force of the diverse uh, lines of research and highlights of the of the impacts as well. This is a real treat. So um, it might be a good time to look through the questions. In the chat, we see not that much at the, at the YouTube chat. But John, I see he has a question. Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions for, for Dr. Cadena. First of all, I, um, this is an amazing talk. I really like it. You know, all those projects working, uh, uh, you are doing there now, they are all mind blowing. <laughs> they have a couple of questions. The first one, and I know they are, you know, kind of involving the, the community in all your projects, but specifically, specifically, how are you involving uh, minorities as, you know, indigenous people and black people in your in your research? And have are you planning to do any of this work, not like in the Andes, but you know, like in the in the Choco, these on these areas? And the second talk, you know, I don't know if people know, but in 2016, Colombia signed an agreement with the FARC, in the peace agreement. So as you have someone have worked in, you know, in ornithology all this time, I think you might, I don't know, see how different ornithology was before 2016 and how it is, is it now. Do you know that this, you know, these new places that this peace agreement like kind of open may have some impact in filling out those gaps that Colombian ornithology or biology overall have had before? Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. I, I appreciate the questions and uh, thanks for your words. Um, yeah, before, I mean, we're trying to make these expeditions as, like I said, as inclusive as possible. So basically what we do is we have a core team in our, in our group that goes to all these places. Uh, but for every expedition, we invite uh, students and ornithologists for, from the regions, like from the local universities and towns like from local uh, bird watching groups that are interested in this kind of work 
and we we have them uh, involved at, at some level. They can participate in the expeditions, they can participate in the workshops where we work with our local communities, or we are also like uh, providing training in, in you know like bird banding and, and field methods and, and that kind of thing. And we try to be very mindful about you know involving a diversity of, of people in terms of career stages, gender, uh, ethnicity, etc. Um, we are also trying to involve the local communities more as sort of our peers, like, you know, these people know a lot about the sites and the birds, so we involve them in conversations. We're trying to treat them not only as our field guides, but as, you know, people we can we can learn from. Um, because most of the sites we have visited are in, in at higher elevations. They, they typically don't have uh, indigenous and, and uh, African, uh, for Colombian uh, communities, but we're very excited, Jan, because we're our next expedition, which is planned for a couple of weeks from now. Uh, we, you asked about the Pacific, and so we're going to uh, Barbacoas Nariño, which is this area in the, uh, you know, uh, Pacific uh, Colombia, uh, which is very exciting, and uh, and we're looking forward to working with local communities there. We we have agreements with the local Afro communities uh, to have them involved. Uh, at, at many levels. And we're very excited at, about that and, and hoping to learn a lot from the experience. And that ties to your second question. So we're, we're going to this place in, in Barbacoas, which I wouldn't go, I wouldn't have, like be, prior to the peace agreement, it was probably a very difficult area. And it still is in part because the Colombian government has not uh, you know, reached uh, many of these areas. So this is places where Historically, there have been uh, guerrillas, there's um, illicit crops, um, drug trafficking, illegal mining. So it's a very complicated area and, and sort of navigating through that is, is difficult. So part of what we're trying to do is also the, exactly what you, what you asked, you know, like, like trying to recover these areas that were difficult for a field research during, you know, the, the armed conflict. And, you know, as Colombians go there and work and build knowledge with, uh, with local communities. It's always hard and, and we're still learning. There's a lot to learn about this community work. And, and I should say that I'm not an expert on all this. We have social scientists involved in the project and, and we see this more as a learning experience than anything else. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have one question from the YouTube chat where Jonathan Losses comments, fabulous talk, Daniel. I was very interested in your finding that closest relatives of species are usually at the same elevation somewhere else. My sense is that others have found the opposite result. Can you compare your work to similar studies elsewhere in South America and other continents? Oh, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for tuning in. Jonathan was another person I, I really learned a lot during my time in St. Louis, so I, I appreciate you, you being here and the question. Well, actually, I think that what we find is very general in terms of birds. Actually, it's the same pattern that has been found across a bunch of different bird plates uh, in different mountain regions, uh, even. We actually have a paper for, for which we received proofs today, which we talk about this more globally. So it's the same you see in New Guinea. Things that replace each other with elevation are not close relatives, they occur in separate areas. Um, but there are some exceptions. One, uh, like say, there are some examples in plants. There are some examples in organisms that have relatively low dispersal abilities, like salamanders, for example. But I think that if I were forced to sort of say what is the general pattern, I think the general pattern is divergence in allopatry and elevational replacements reflecting secondary conflict. Actually, we're just right now working on, on an analysis with uh, colleagues that I met in St. Louis, uh, Felipe Zapata, who's a professor at UCLA, and Lucia Loman, who is a professor at the University of Sao Paulo, and Adriana Sanchez uh, and her group here in, in, in Colombia, looking at data for plants, which I think is going to be very exciting. Um, uh, we don't know what's going on in plants, and perhaps there are reasons in, in plants to expect, given their perhaps more limited dispersal abilities, um, that you might find more examples of parapatric divergence with elevation. I should qualify that, Jonathan, saying that there's a lot of evidence of adaptive phenotypic and genetic variation with elevation in tropical elevational gradients. 
but there is very little evidence that such adaptive divergence has reached the point where you have different species speciation in, in, in parapatry. I don't know if, if there's too much gene flow or, or the selection gradients are not strong enough to generate reproductive isolation. But if I were forced again to say what is the predominant mode, I'd say it's allopatric divergence and secondary content. Okay, it looks like we have one late breaking final question from William Farfano Rios, who says, Fantastic talk, Carlos. Many thanks. The question is along the elevational gradients in the Andes. What will be the elevation zone where more di bird diversification rates happen? Well, that, that's a very good question. Um, we haven't worked on, on that a whole lot, but there's work by other people like uh, Ignacio Quintero has worked on this a little bit, uh, and uh, Jan Fieldson, his group. And it turns out that um, it's interesting that diversification rates appear to be higher at higher elevations, yet diversity in those areas is lower. So it's something similar to what you can see in terms of the latitudinal gradient of diversity. So there's a bunch of, of studies showing that rates of uh, speciation, rates of phenotypic divergence, et cetera, uh, rates of secondary sympathy might be higher in the temperate zone, yet species richness is higher in the tropics. And perhaps what's, what goes on here is that, well, environments that are very unstable and very dynamic through time might generate a lot of uh, diversity via speciation, but in the same way, there's a lot of, uh, of disappearance of species via extinction, whereas lower elevations and, and uh, lower latitude are areas where perhaps speciation does not occur as fast, but the balance of speciation and extinction tends to be more positive because extinction is lower. So that's, uh, I think, what is known right now. Okay, with that, we want to conclude the seminar. Thank everyone else for attending and give one last final thanks to Dr. Cadena for his generous time and lecture here. Um, with that, we would also like to now switch over for those who have any remaining questions into the uh, post-seminar reception, uh, which for which the link has been provided to other graduate students and anyone else who is interested. Um, so thank you everyone for your attention and for participating. Thanks again for inviting me and, and for tuning in. It's been a pleasure.